Welcome to our fifth webinar in this series, uh, which is part of our NGO Disaster Preparedness Program, a partnership program of between IRRR and Give to Asia. And it's a program where we are building the capacities and strengthening capacities of local NGOs in at least six countries in Asia. Our webinar uh, today, the topic is on policy advocacy and movement building. There is a growing recognition of the role of local NGOs and their community partners in disaster risk reduction and preparedness. Given the limited investments going to local or NGOs and local communities, these local actions remain to be smaller in scale. Therefore, local NGOs need to work together as alliances and movements in their countries to bring about effective engagement with governments not just in policy making, but more on the implementation of effective DRR and disaster preparedness programs. In this fifth series of the webinar, we have invited resource speakers who will share to us with an overview of the policy landscape in Asia and in countries, as well as the current government engagement of NGO alliances to bring DRR and preparedness to scale. So the objectives of our webinar, at the end of this webinar, the participants, we hope that uh, we will, they will understand the principles of policy advocacy and movement building for DRR. Second objective is know the good, what are good practices and tips from our resource persons in engaging with government and civil society uh, with regards to policy work uh, and policy implementation. And number three objective is we hope that at the end of this webinar, we will be able to inspire participants you know, by sharing our experiences uh, and, and, and exchange of best practices. We will be inspired, them, we hope to inspire them in, in doing more action in, in disaster preparedness and disaster risk reduction in their respective countries. So without further uh, introductions. I will start now introduce, introducing our first resource speaker. I'm honored to introduce our first uh, speaker. Our first speaker is Ms. Jessica Dator Bersilia, a member of the ACT Alliance, a global community of practice on DRR and climate change adaptation, and, and, and also the ACT Alliance Climate Change Advocacy Group. Jessica is also a senior advocacy and policy officer for Asia. Middle East and uh, Middle East for Christian Aid. She is also a member of the faculty and former program director for climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and a senior research associate of the Ateneo School of Government, Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines, and a science policy and research specialist fellow at the Manila Observatory, a scientific research institution with research work in the fields of atmospheric and earth science in the Philippines and in, South, in, and in the Southeast Asian region. Jessica also serves as a consultant and resource person for different schools and government agencies for topics on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. She holds a master's degree, a master of arts degree in international development studies at the Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada and took uh, academic units in PhD on holistic foundations in biosafety at the University of Tromso in Norway. Good day, Jessica, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, uh, Hello. For, for, Good your, for your discussion, uh, can you uh, give us uh, like an overview of the current DRR policy landscape you know, globally and in the Asian region? Uh, as, as, we, as we heard from your uh, you know, introduction is that you are engaged not just in the Philippines but also in the region in terms of working with governments and policy. So, can you help us like understand uh, our participants in terms of what is the policy landscape here in Asia, and then what are the opportunities for local NGOs to engage with these policies in the region and in the country? Jessica. 
Um, okay, hi uh, everybody. Good morning. Um, actually, there were uh, you know a couple of things that, that were assigned to me, and the uh, uh, best way was uh, to start with uh, looking at global frameworks for DRR, and then exploring, of course, as I said, the uh, DRR policy landscape and um, uh, policy advocacy, and and why is it important to the work that we have as CSOs. Um, uh, if you go to the third slide of my uh, presentation, um, I hope the, the attendees are looking at it. Uh, all of you perhaps have already heard and know of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, whose goal is basically um, to ensure the reduction in terms of the losses of lives, livelihoods, and um, assets of, uh, of peoples, communities, and, and countries around the world. Uh, but alongside that, in 2015, um, the you know the 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 world actually saw uh, several uh, global frameworks that were being uh, developed, and among which is of course the Sustainable Development Goals that were enhanced based on our lessons from the Millennium Development Goals. And they actually saw that there was a complementarity between. Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, and then the Sustainable Development Goals, um, knowing and recognizing fully well that the world will never be able to meet its sustainable development targets without addressing the key elements you know, of disaster risk, which is addressing the hazards, addressing exposure, and addressing vulnerabilities. Having said that, um, on the same year in 2015, there has been global frameworks, you know, the uh, other global frameworks that have been uh, uh, closely examined and developed. And another of which is the Paris Agreement, um, uh, uh, which focuses time on, on climate change. So all of these uh, global frameworks impact heavily, you know, on how development is going to be done in countries. And so the experts try to explore uh, what, could be the possible nexus of the three um, uh, main frameworks, the SFDRR, the Paris Agreement, and the SDGs, so that we are able to, to implement projects more efficiently, uh, programs and projects more efficiently. And, and when the technical experts try to examine uh, the nexus between all the three frameworks, they discover that all the three frameworks meant to address uh, reducing vulnerabilities and enhancing resilience. Having said that, if we are able to address the reduction of vulnerabilities and, and enhance resilience, we will be able to significantly contribute to all of the three frameworks and all the overriding, uh, overarching fr frameworks um, uh, globally. Um, now, to, to examine the DRR landscape in, in Asia, uh, because of the limited time that we have, uh, I'll just draw from the, the, the lessons that we learned from the Ul Ulaanbaatar Declaration in 2018, um, and, and, um, uh, which, are, which was developed uh, following the AMC DRR or during the AMC DRR. Uh, one of the first lessons that the declaration pointed out is that Definitely, we are now seeing more disasters occurring in, in um, Asia, but there is a need to focus on underlying and interconnected evolving disaster risk factors. The prior assessments of the Yogo Framework for Action saw that where we have failed miserably is in addressing vulnerability reduction. So my reflection on that is, is that we really need to sharpen, you know, um, uh, our, our capacity for risk assessment. And this will have implication on the work of civil society organizations around the world because um, we are so used to community-based risk assessments and participatory risk assessments that we need to re-examine how we do risk assessment if we aim to, to really contribute you know, to, to significantly addressing the underlying risk factors because definitely there's a blind side of how far community risk, risk assessments can go. Um, and, and, and uh, hopefully we'll have room to recognize the role of, of science and technology in our own analysis. Uh, then we, we do have to recognize the value of early action and early warning in disaster preparedness, and it, it's links to the avoidance of, of loss and damage. Um, 
the second um, lesson that we get there is the need for coherence. As I said, we did not have in 2015, we did, did not just have the three um, you know, main frameworks developed, but there were all other frameworks. And you can see that from the slide. I don't need to, to read each one of them. And, and they all demand on national governments for compliance. And how do you think a nation would be able to do that? The solution there is secure the mainstreaming of, uh, of, of all of these uh, overarching frameworks, the nexus of these frameworks in local, subnational, and national development planning. Um, the third is the emphasis that must be given on strengthening resilience of communities, persons, and countries. Why, why was this um, raised? Uh, for many years that we've been implementing, you know, uh, disaster risk reduction, not countries, you know, have been implementing disaster risk reduction. There has been a large emphasis on infrastructure. You know, um, I'm not saying uh, they're not good, so there's uh, strengthening schools, hospitals, etc. you know, bridges, roads, buildings, you know. But there, there, there is a specific recognition in the declaration that we need to invest on resilience uh, that, that focuses on resilience of persons, communities, and environment before or alongside the other dimensions mentioned. And last but not the least, you know, um, uh, we need to recognize the role played by uh, various stakeholders, groups as enablers, partnering with governments and and communities, which means the recognition of, of organizations such as uh, civil society organizations and other stakeholders. Uh, my take on that is if governments do recognize the role of local actors, there must be a corresponding policy and budget to mobilize community action on addressing disaster risk. Um, Having said that, we have so many policy frameworks on DRR across Asia, and there's a big gap in implementation, um, and there's a big gap on, on financing. They always say in policy advocacy that budget is the articulation of that policy, and so we must be able to, to make sure that we have both and we advocate for, for both. Now, what about policy advocacy and why is it important? So uh, we always say that policy is about enabling specific change in courses of action reflected in legislation and regulation uh, or regulation and directed at uh, decision makers. But I would like to say that we need to also include those who can possibly influence them. And this is where movement building is necessary because we always think that the public as the constituency of government will have the capacity to influence the decision makers. While, of course, we have this call in policy advocacy to influence the public domain, which means governments, um, the, the constituency, and other decision makers, we also need to recognize the role of the private sector because business actually uh, impacts heavily on how the government functions, um, and also those with sectoral interests and those who can make demands on them. Um, uh, but I'd like to, my last slide is, is uh, actually trying to unpack the link between policy advocacy and movement building. Uh, there's al almost an elitist perspective that policy advocacy, you know, is the, that advocacy that you have in, in, in um, uh, uh, the push for, and the work around governments and lobbying, while movement building is work around communities. You know, they're not separate. These two are part of a continuum continuum of action necessary for change you know so they are both part of a single continuum they are supposed to be linked complementary and they should be in synergy with each other and i think i'd, I'd, I'd pause there and we'll entertain questions later thank you very much thank you very much uh, jessica i think uh you know, think, I, I know you're very busy with, with, with your work, but you know, big, big, making time to join this webinar is very much appreciated. Just to highlight like my key takeaways and while, while looking at your presentation, listening to you, uh, I, I think one of the key takeaways that I have is that you know, countries now are now moving towards a more integrated view of disaster risk, climate change, and development. Like we, we are not seeing, we are now looking more on resilience building rather than looking at each of these uh, components separately, which is has happened, which has happened a lot in the past. While you know, while, while this is great that there is an integrated view now of you know addressing this disaster risk and climate change, 
and poverty, we are still facing with huge challenges in making this a reality. And I think the Ulan Batar Declaration, uh, which is a good update for, for me and for all our participants uh, you know, here in Asia, that you know, this declaration seeks to address, I think there are very important points you raised on, on three points. So one is the, the important that we need to prioritize that we should address the underlying causes of disaster risk. You know, it, we, should, we should not just be focusing on preparedness for responding, but we should be able to be, take a more proactive role in addressing uh, disaster risks. So you mentioned the importance of risk assessments and early warning. I think we should you know, take note of that. And secondly, is the importance of having coherence in our national DRR policies and programs and resilience building programs. There seems to be some coherence at the global level, but in countries, there are still need a lot of building that kind of coherence in the way our governments uh, work. And I think this is where the opportunity of local NGOs, because they are always in the front lines to build that kind of coherence in policy and policy making and policy implementation within countries. And then finally, you mentioned a lot about investments. And this is where you know, a key component of this program of IIRR and Give to Asia is seeking to increase the investments uh, for disaster risk reduction. But I like your presentation where you know, investment should not just be on hard physical you know, projects, but more importantly, investments for people investments for community systems. Uh, one, one thing you mentioned is the importance of having for government to invest in venue, creating some space for government engagement for local organizations, and then investments for our environment. So for those who are in the participants and those who are just joining us, uh, we will have a late, uh, we will have a Q&A session after all the spe speakers have you know, made their opening statements. And uh, so res reserve your uh, questions. You, we have also a Q&A box in the web, in the Zoom uh, platform. So if you have any question, you can click that one and, and then put the, type in your questions and then I will read them uh, and for our speakers to respond. So again, thank you so much, Jessica. So let's now move on to, to our next speaker. So our next speaker is from Nepal. So he is currently in, in Kathmandu. So our next speaker is Ram Chandra Nyupani. He is the Executive Director of Eco Nepal and Advisor at the Disaster Preparedness Network Nepal. So DPNet is one of the largest uh, as, uh, alliance of local NGOs and international organizations working for disaster preparedness in Nepal. So for over 30 years, Ram has worked for environmental conservation and the mainstreaming of disaster risk reduction climate change adaptation in government. His uh, work, his active work on policy and planning, uh, capacity building and coordination with government and with other NGOs made him a widely recognized leader and development expert in the field of DRR in Nepal. His technical inputs for a national level DRR policy and the strategic formulation process of action plans and programs of the government of Nepal were very instrumental to, to the development of government guidelines to facilitate disaster management plans from the district to the national level. So Ram also served as a publisher and editor of the monthly Nepali magazine, Pariyawaran, and he supports the development of different DRR and, and, and climate change adaptation communication materials. So Ram holds a Master of Science degree on disaster mitigation in Sikkim Ma in India in 2011. Good day, Ram, and welcome to our webinar. We are very happy to, to have you here and joining us. So you have been uh, through DPNet and Eco Nepal. You have worked uh, with, with the government of Nepal in supporting DRR and climate change adaptation work for quite some time now. So can you give us like an update on like what's the current uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation work or policies in Nepal uh, 
you know how, how your how the alliance disaster preparedness network and nepal have engaged governments and engaged other ngos and civil societies to bring about a positive change in policy and then in policy implementation uh, i'm sure we will learn a number of things from from your experience in nepal so ram yeah, thank you thank you wilson it's a wonderful thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to share our experience in uh, policy landscape in Nepal on DRR. Uh, basically, we, uh, uh, um, uh, our, uh, our networks, Japanese Nepal and other alliances, engaged, in, uh, engaged for the uh, development of new policy landscape uh, on DRR since uh, 2005. 2005. Uh, after, uh, after a long time, we received disaster risk uh, Reduction and Management Act in um, uh, 2017 after the earthquake, uh, Gorkha earthquake. Similarly, we received some uh, national uh, DRR policy uh, 2018 and Strategic Action Plan 2018-30 uh, based on the Sendai framework and the uh, other uh, global conventions. Uh, and now the pro provincial three in the in the three tiers of the government. Uh, government um, uh, three tiers of government in Nepal now, uh, the provincial and uh, local level, uh, local government are, are also uh, preparing the policy guidelines and frameworks on DRR and humanitarian um, support, uh, the relief guideline, uh, relief and rescue guideline. Uh, this is uh, this is the this is the milestone of DRR in Nepal, and uh, up before uh, before then. Uh, 2008, the government endorsed uh, the cluster system, uh, developed the guidelines and frameworks uh, for the humanitarian support in the emergency. These are uh, these are some milestones, and now we, uh, the government is uh, going to establish disaster, uh, national disaster risk reduction authority uh, near future. The guideline in the in the next uh, slide, uh, we I I reflect uh, I, I reflect the I reflect uh, the working modality with the government and CSOs and and Nepal. Uh, the DPNET is the, uh, the coordinating body, uh, and it's, it's a bridging. Uh, it's bridging with the community CSOs and INGOs, NGOs, community level organizations, uh, and the uh, and the government. And this uh, the the DPNET is working for the policy advocacy, knowledge management, capacity building, and coordination and networking within the within the country and regional level as well. Uh, just like Sati South Asia, uh, Sati has been formed last uh, last year in, in 2016. This is the this is the networking modality and working together with government and uh, civil society organizations. Uh, next please. And uh, this is the the major uh, major major uh, uh, the efforts of CSOs and DPNET is uh, aware educate inform organize and unite for the policy and uh, policy and practice change on for drr because policy is not uh, policy is only a means means uh, for the uh, practice it's a it's a guide to people and the authorities uh, to uh, change the practice on uh, for drr and uh, similarly now the, in the uh, in the new context Policy research and knowledge building is going to on. Uh, lobbying with uh, with the parliamentarian and policy makers uh, is the very key component uh, to um, uh, milestoning the policy landscape. It was our uh, major comp uh, major part activities, and social movement and campaigns which was organized since uh, 2005 and uh, 2009. Uh, we organized. Uh, uh, people's caravan on DRR, uh, which support to develop new 
uh, policy uh, landscape in, this, in the country. Backstopping government in Sun Sui, the definite uh, coordinating with um, civil society organizations and as well as in, to the uh, government for the policy formulation. It was a, it was a wonderful um, pause. Next, please. In the, in the next slide, uh, some activities implemented by CSOs and policy advocacy social movement, capacity building at all levels on DRM, just like now we are, uh, we are um, uh, conducting some activities in the local level, as well as provincial level, as well as uh, federal level. And uh, we uh, organize some collect collection of good practice development reports and just like Nepal uh, disaster report, work RC report, as well as uh, some agencies are will uh, develop and publish some good practices. And these are the best, uh, uh, the advocacy will run based on these uh, documents and learnings. And uh, the people's caravan, I already explained that. And next please. And uh, we, we are in the new, uh, new uh, height and DRR in the, in the country, but uh, there are some challenges for the implementation uh, because lack of uh, trust on DRR is a new discipline. It's, it's a, as a new, it's a, uh, we, uh, the myth, myth of the disaster is uh, in the society and coherence uh, gap between DRR and development frameworks because it is a very important uh, now uh, uh, how can we uh, coherence uh, how can we uh, mainstreaming DRR into development it's a, it's a, it's a uh, question um, question again and uh, underfunding uh, just like Jessica uh, already mentioned uh, the funding resource mobilization and funding status is a very, it's a very uh, challenging uh, for the least developed country or developing countries on DRR and climate change adaptation. And absence of institution of policy research and skill for DRR functions, just like uh, we have not a good, uh, perfect human resource uh, and resource uh, for DRR as a, as a, as a professional. And this, these are the, some, and lack of common understanding, perception, and prioritize among actors, because so many actors are working here in the country, and they have a different um, approaches, uh, different types of understanding. Uh, it's, these are the big challenges for us. Uh, next, please. And uh, what do we learn from the uh, collaboration with the government? The civil society have some uh, key key uh, learning disaster is departure for the policy change. It is a, it is a very important component. And global environment support adopting change in policy and practice, just like co, uh, just like um, uh, Sendai framework and SDG. These are the major priority uh, to the uh, collaboration. Is to develop the collaboration. Young professionals and policymakers are ready to adopt new ideas because uh, uh, we have now new uh, young generations are coming in the bureaucracy and as well as in the political leaders, as a political leaders. leaders they have uh, some idea to change the idea and to, to adopt new uh, technology and uh, development modality. Uh, similarly, uh, the domination of the relief, uh, relief then risk reduction approach it's a it's a big uh, challenge. Uh, the, uh, it's a learning uh, because uh, uh, so many agencies will engage in the relief. Uh, then, then the risk reduction approach and local disaster resilient plan is a key instrument for mitigation and preparedness because the go, uh, government already uh, developed and endorsed the uh, local disaster resilient plan guideline, uh, which is uh, in built in. Uh, climate change adaptation and uh, disaster risk reduction. That's so those so many local uh, government are uh, going to develop uh, their action plan uh, based on the uh, uh, federal um, policy and frameworks. 
these are the major lessons and please again next please and uh, uh, joint advocacy assessing global resource and drr collaboration because it's our good experience then uh, sixth amc drr bank of the before before sendai uh, framework because uh, the government of nepal jointly collaborate with the uh, civil society organization to participate in international uh, regional advocacy for drr funding and strong networking among the government for coherence and localization of drr and other development frameworks because uh, so many development organizations have a skill and they have a technical knowledge for the uh, for the um, uh, instrumental instrument to development and into, uh, link between disaster and development that's a, it's a it's our understanding and government is uh, need to work with uh, uh, civil society organizations and international organization as well and uh, technical back stopping uh, to local government for policy formulation education and drr mainstreaming it is a very important because after the 20 years the local government has uh, been established in in the country it's a, that's a, it's a very important to uh, support them technically and financially as well enhance a boundaryless partnership on drr and humanitarian affairs is a very important it's a it's a for the uh, uh, nepal is a landlocked country and it's a very important to um, uh, enhance uh, and enhance a boundaryless uh, partnership for the drr and humanitarian basically humanitarian support as well these are the these are the major learning and our experience in the um, policy development process and implementation as well as in nepal just like our government is uh, developing a mainstreaming guideline drr and climate change adaptation mainstreaming guideline into planning process this is uh, it will come very soon these are the policy formulation and policy landscape of the nepal thank you Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Ram. I think uh, from your presentation, it seems that the uh, DPNet has been really very busy uh, in the past years of leading and organizing civil society in Kathmandu and in Nepal in general to engage with the Nepal government. And uh, just for everybody's uh, you know understanding, Nepal government is has been always been in a transition, right? You just passed the constitution. <laughs> Uh, very recently, after many years of not having a constitution, so I, I think you have made great strides uh, in terms of uh, formulating DRR policies at national level. And then there are a number of actions that uh, are happening now uh, at the local level. So my my key takeaways that we can we, we should think about and remember from your presentation, Ram, is that. Uh, local NGOs, when they engage with policy work, it's not enough to it's not enough to just engage at the national level policy. You know, it, it, our work should not stop when there's already a national law, because the bigger work we should be doing, local NGOs, is the localization of these national policies. And I think DPNet has uh, worked a lot in that area by supporting the districts, the village, uh, in formulating disaster management plans and budgets and other local policies. So I think that's a very important uh, you know, role that local NGOs in Nepal uh, played uh, in, 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 in policy work. The second role that I think local NGOs also, you mentioned that uh, it's a role, is to be a technical partner of our government. So meaning uh, we, local NGOs can provide the knowledge base on disaster risk reduction, climate change, and resilience. We can uh, be that the local NGOs, like what DPNet is doing, is providing the evidence base for policy making and policy implementation. So you have done a number of research and communication uh, with government and policy makers in that aspect. You also help government train their staff uh, on disaster risk reduction and disaster preparedness. And then finally is the, the advocacy you know, of work of DPNet is, and I think for everybody, 
to think about is the continuing advocacy to for our government to continue to provide the space for us to engage them. You know, with this uh, current and many changes now, uh, there's a lot of negative publicity about NGOs, you know, in different countries. And I think that should always also be a priority for our movements that you know, we continue to talk with government and create that space for us to, you know, for our voices to be heard uh, among these local and national level discussions on policy and policy implementation. So on that note, Ram, thank you very much again for, for joining us. Uh, but stay on during, uh, for the entire webinar. We will have a Q&A uh, Q and A discussion later on. I already have a number of questions here being raised, but I will go back uh, to them after our uh, speakers have made their opening statements. So our next speaker is from Myanmar. So our next speaker is from the country of Myanmar. Uh, he is Zin Min Tan. Uh, he is the learning and development practitioner at Marsh Practitioners Network and a member of the advisory committee for VERB volunteer program. Uh, VERB is a Sendai voluntary commitment by Marsh Practitioners Network in, the, in Myanmar. Sin Min is also the founder of the Myanmar Disaster Preparedness Initiative. He, is, he trained and, and facilitated a number of workshops in Myanmar on DRR and climate change adaptation, humanitarian response, WASH, and emergency response to different you know, different officials of civil society, government, and the private sector. Uh, he has worked with many local and international NGOs in Myanmar, including Oxfam, Plan, Plan International, Save Children, and the Swiss Embassy. He also worked uh, with the Myanmar Consortium for Disaster Risk Reduction and with the DRR, the Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group in Myanmar. He previously was the National Program Officer for Humanitarian Aid and the DRR focal point of the Swiss Embassy uh, in Myanmar, where he represented the organization in dialogues and negotiations with implementing partners on different policy issues on humanitarian aid and disaster risk reduction in Myanmar. He, ho he holds a Master of Public Administration degree from Aldersgate College here in the Philippines and a postgraduate diploma for social work at Yangon University. Good day, Zinmin, Minglaba. Welcome to our discussion. So uh, what's happening in Myanmar, Zinmin, in terms of policy work and uh, you know, our organizing in, in our local civil society and working and engaging with government, uh, with the emerging policy environment and DRR. So what are the, the current priorities and pressing issues in Myanmar? Uh, in terms of government policies for DRR and in terms also of the engagement of our very active and dynamic local NGO communities in uh, Myanmar. Zinmin? Zin, are you online? Let me check whether Zin is online. Your, uh, he's in mute. I don't know. Uh, I think his uh, he's hang. Hang or he is uh, on mute. Uh, anyway. Uh, so, okay, and, and, and anyway, uh, for after our first two speakers, you know, Jessica and then uh, Ram, I do have a number of questions here. Uh, one is addressed to, to Jessica. Maybe Jessica can make some comments while uh, we are uh, waiting for Zinmin to connect uh, to the webinar. So, you mentioned, Jessica, uh, this is for you. You mentioned about the budget, which, uh, you know, which, which should recognize uh, local actors or involved in the local implementation of DRR policies. So 
what do you think a local NGO should do to ensure that you know to, to to convince government that local NGOs are are important uh, partners in uh, you know in in the implementation of DRR because you mentioned uh, government should give recognition and more support for local NGOs and uh, and and this is not easy to do so what do you think would be a good approach to ensure that you know we can we can convince and sell the role of local NGOs with government uh, so. actually there were uh, two points raised on the chat box uh, the, mm. but I'll, I'll go first with that with, with that initial question mm. you know my biggest suggestion is not for to advocate for funding for NGOs mm. Um, oh, I think we all agree here. I think Loy, who is a uh, main proponent of community-based disaster risk reduction, uh, you know, is that we advocate for the value of community-based disaster risk reduction and making sure that the the budget reaches the the, the very local level and that um, the approach in implementation should be multi-stakeholder because to view it as a fund specifically for NGOs will be self-serving. There are actually a, a di different layers you know, of community actors. You have people's organizations, you have community, uh, you know, uh, community-based organizations, and you have NGOs. Uh, uh, and we're all gunning for community-managed support. For so, my my take is not to advocate for yourself to receive that, and then you get to win it. Um, uh, do we have an example for it? Yes, we have an example for it. Uh, we've won it for in the Philippines and uh, having a local disaster risk reduction and, and management fund. Um, there's, there are also direct access mechanisms in some of the international financing platforms. Uh, on, mm. on, uh, uh, and, and I think we can follow that suit. So I think I'll end there because uh, Min is uh, already on board, I think, and I'll, I'll mm. answer the other questions later. Okay, thank you. Th thank you, Jessica. I think Zin Min is already uh, online. So Zin Min, uh, we are ready now for your presentation. Hello, good morning. Um, Ming Lava from Myanmar. Ming Lava. Um, thank you very much for giving opportunity to me and to share Myanmar experience on DRR like this, uh, with no, this kind of a webinar. Yep. So can I start my presentation? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will start with the DR law and policies in Myanmar. So uh, before Cyclone Nagus hit Myanmar in 2008, we don't have any any policy or law on DRI in Myanmar. But after Cyclone Nagus hit Myanmar, and and you know in 2009, the, uh, at the time the, the government, uh, uh, I mean that there's the. Standing order 2009 is the, the one the only only in the one policy in Myanmar, but this is only for the government department. Uh, what to do? You know, one this is a hit to Myanmar. So and then uh, after that, in 2013, uh, the disaster management law was enacted. Um, you know, uh, so because of that, uh, we have a national disaster management committee and and also the um, government-led uh, disaster management training center in Myanmar. And then again, 2015, we have a disaster management rule. Uh, because of this, this rule, uh, we, uh, Myanmar could establish a disaster management committee at different level, start from the national, you know, and then state and regional level, and also the, the township level, and also up to the village level. So also, we, we could develop uh, Myanmar action plan on DRR. We call it MAD DRR, which is uh, for two, 2017 to 2013. These, these are the, the current laws and policy in Myanmar. Next, please. So um, the key actors involved in the development of a policy and, and you know, uh, policy and law in Myanmar is Myanmar DRR working group which is composed of local NGOs, international NGOs, UN agency, institutions, and individuals in Myanmar. Myanmar. So, and what, I mean, again, in, in, in this DRA working group, the role of the local NGO is also playing uh, uh, as a vital role. Uh, for example, mass practitioner network is the 
you know, one of the steering committee members of the DR working group. Also, again, under the DR working group, we have a, we call it TTF, Technical Test Force. Uh, we have different technical test force, for example, CBTR test force, awareness raising uh, test force, or, you know, uh, capacity building test force, et cetera. So, most uh, then uh, are led by the local NGOs in Myanmar. So, um, and the DRI working group is supporting the government, mainly for the Department of the Disaster Management and the Ministry of Social Welfare and Relief and Settlement for the, um, the development of the policy and the guidelines and, the, and, and the action plan, etc. So, the DM law and MAP DRI, I mean, supporting the DRI working group is supporting the government as well as the development of the DM law and the MAP. It lead into the better direction and the establishment of Myanmar Preparedness Partnership. So, um, followed by the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul uh, in 2016, uh, the, 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 the decision was made uh, to implement uh, DRI activities uh, together with the government, local NGO, CSO, and the private sector uh, in Africa region and Asia region. So, AFPP and APP. So, Myanmar is one of the the six country under the APP to implement DRR with new approach. I mean, new approach means with uh, you know the together work, to work together with the government, look at NGO CSO, and also the private sector. So therefore, MPP is composed of three main sector in country: government, CSO, look at NGOs, and private sectors. So Myanmar Preparedness Partnership MPP is composed of, like I mentioned, three main sector in Myanmar and found using a tripartite approach, uh, I mean, between the government and the local NGO, NIMA NGO network and the private sector. Again, in the role of the NIMA NGO network in MPP is also playing uh, in a vital role together with, you know, government. They design together. I mean, they, 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 they work together, they discuss together, and then they design together for the activities of MPP. And also, you know, uh, MVP is also mandated to do capacity building, strengthening coordination of the disaster management body at all levels. So MVP, um, the achievement of MVP so far is uh, uh, train 240 individuals from the, the, the set three centers, uh, government department, local NGO, CSO, and the private sector in eight districts in Myanmar. Um, and also, uh, from the 240 individuals, uh, MPP selected 24 individuals from eight districts, and then uh, for the further study at the Hindra Disaster Management Training Center, which is led by the government. Also, established network among the 240 trainings, and also uh, MPP conducted business resilience forums in eight districts, also conducting coordination meeting in eight districts. I mean, uh, for, for to, to have a, to, to re replicate the tribalic approach at the township and states and the regional level as well. Next please. So the challenge, um, the active participation of private sector to our, the government and CSO and look at NGO is, uh, is, is, uh, is challenging as well. Because they, I mean, it is, they need to understand, you know, the, the importance of the disaster preparedness or the business resilience for, for their, uh, business businesses. So then, it, then the if they understand the, the importance of the resilience, then they will participate. Another challenge is the you know because in Myanmar district disaster management committee or township disaster management committee. So all state disaster management committee, or the regional disaster management committee. So all of these committees are formed because of the disaster management law. And all, all of the committee are formed by the government officials only, only the government officials. So the, the issue is that, you know, for, for, for the member of the disaster management committee, they have their own, um, you know, own job, 
from the uh, mother department. And also we have an, another role to play in the disaster management committee, which is also quite challenging for them. So that these disaster management committee need to be stronger, need to be strengthened by bringing the CSU and then look at NGO and also the private sector to the district or the township level. So then, you know, the, the government officer relative really to bring CSO and local NGO, I mean, uh, to the government led disaster management com com comedy because of the, you know, different nature. Yeah, next please. So, we bought from Myanmar is um, we need to review and revise disaster our disaster management law because a disaster management law is uh, um, mostly emphasizing on the emergency response, not for the preparedness. So it, it is need to be reviewed and revised. Also, conversation of the disaster management body, like I mentioned, uh, because all the disaster management bodies are composed of, I mean, with the government officials only. So we need to bring the local NGO, CSO, and private sector to the disaster management body at all level. And also to strengthen the affected early warning system in Myanmar. So these are the, you know, the, the information on DRR in Myanmar. And thank you. Thank you, Zinmin. Uh, Jezuba. <laughs> Jezuba. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, your your uh, presentation about uh, current updates in uh, Myanmar, what's happening in Myanmar, is that it uh, continues to be a dynamic country where government is, uh, you know, taking positive progress in terms of policy making of DRR policies, and then the NGOs are very dynamic, like different working groups and committees and all. But but what I really like with with your presentation, which I think we can discuss more in the next uh, discussion, is uh, the engagement with private sector. Uh, Jessica mentioned this a little bit early in in her early presentation, and you also mentioned this that in Myanmar you are working with the private sector and you are having challenges of local NGOs engaging with the private sector when it comes to disaster risk reduction and preparedness. Uh, for one, the private sector is a new stakeholder. It requires some different approach, a different way of thinking and, and the tools that, that NGOs need to understand for them to effectively engage with, 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 with the private sector and you know, take them to, to participate or be involved and contribute to disaster risk reduction and preparedness. So on that on that note, Zim, thank you again for 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 taking time to share your updates and your perspective from the Myanmar side of things on policy advocacy, movement building, and government engagement. So at at, at this note, uh, I still have I'm still receiving a number of questions here already uh, that we can you know revisit. We cannot discuss all of them I think in this webinar, but we'll prioritize which one we can talk about, but we will respond to all of them uh, uh, offline. We'll send you all the participants, the email of these questions, and then the responses from the panelists. Now, in this webinar, we have invited uh, Loy Rego. You know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's been around uh, for some time in the DRR circle. And, uh, you know, uh, we wanted to hear from, from, from him a reaction from, from his what he heard from our three speakers and from his exposure in different parts in, of the region in Asia uh, of, of, his, of his reaction. So Loy is a researcher, a learning practitioner, and a facilitator of the Myanmar Marsh Practitioners Network and a VERB volunteer program. So Loy is also a former deputy executive director at the Asian Sasser Preparedness Center in Thailand and the head of the Secretariat of the Regional Consultative Committee for DRR, and a, for, and, a, and a joint director at the India's National Safety Council. So Loy has a 40-year career in disaster preparedness, risk reduction, resilience building, climate change adaptation, risk management, and how all of this links to sustainable development and public safety. He has worked on the UNISDR online dialogue in, 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 
in uh, 2015. Uh, it was like an online discussion and a global discussion on what are the views on the Hyogo Framework for Action in preparation for the meeting in Sentai. Uh, and the global call for action against poverty and climate justice and the MDG SDGs linkages in the post 2015 development ag agenda. So Loy is, is an engineer by training. He holds a postgraduate diploma in industrial safety from the Indian Institute of Technology and a law degree from the University of Pune in India. So Loy, can you give us I'm your reaction? Actually, on... back, back in India, though I normally live in Cairo, no, I just want to make a few comments. I, I, I'll, I'll first talk very briefly about India in the sense that we have been under uh, innovative effort since somewhere around the mid-90s to reform our institutions. Uh, we had three major disasters in 93, in, in 99 and 2001, which were earth-moving, earth-shattering, as well as the regular annual events. Uh, and they were pretty major themselves. So the new law came into being from 2005. And there is much that remains to be implemented, but much that has been achieved. Uh, there are three levels of institutions set up. These are under-resourced, but they have an important role and they're playing new roles. And I think that's important and valuable. Having said that, there's much more which needs to be done. So uh, for me, NGOs need to be advocacy partners. They need to be active implementing partners of both local governments, uh, local government institutions, and keep a check and balance. So, th so there are two roles which NGOs have to play. We also need to involve community members and the private sector. So, but the other big, bigger challenge, I want to focus on two or three challenges. One is how do we sustain beyond projects, especially internationally funded projects? So we need to use local sources of money or volunteer time. And I think this is very important. Uh, we need to sustain these institutional structures for all time to come, which means they must have active programs and they must cover to scale the entire geographical area they ad uh, administer. So I think these are challenging objectives, but uh, uh, they need to be done. Now, each of the three countries have, uh, so, so apart from India, the other three countries also I'm somewhat familiar with. And uh, they have undergone major changes. There have been improvements. There have been projects and programs and government action, which has helped operationalize some of the new arrangements. But there's lots more that needs to be done. And let's use the period of the Sendai framework and beyond in making these changes. So I'm happy to answer any question. And sorry, I'm actually running for a conference. So I need to go in about five minutes time. So if there are any questions, please send them to me. But otherwise, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Loy, for, for that uh, quick, uh, you know, sharing of oh, your yeah. opinion on points on, on, on what needs to be done in terms of achieving scale and working, continue to engage with other NGOs and governments. So at this point, uh, we are now entertaining the, some questions. Uh, we have a number of questions here. So uh, about, Wilson, yeah. yes? I don't think yes. you need to, to read each of them to save on time. Yes. You can just uh, respond to them if it's okay. Yes, yes, Jessica. So uh, there, you mentioned earlier that uh, there's a second question that you want to respond to. Yeah, uh, yes. though just I think uh, because I've read the, the questions, I'd just like to tie them together. And I think uh, my other uh, panelists will, will also jump in there. Uh, Chris raised an important point of uh, accelerating uh, the need for integration. And uh, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, Chris, this will not be, be possible without us having a clarity uh, of understanding, you know, on, on what disaster risk reduction really means. I have to be brutally honest that not even us in the CSO sector have are on the same page. How much more can we impose on the government? And so we really have to up our ante 
and and taking serious the taking serious uh, uh, serious measures to build our own internal capacities for analysis on disaster risk reduction um, uh, and uh, and its linkages with uh, mitigation and and adaptation. So that's my. My, my my response to your to your query, uh, but the Pankar also raised a raise a point. You know, having having said that, he raised a a question on metrics based action planning. Uh, if if it's really to have a particular impact at at the at the lo local level. Um, uh, Dipankar, the private sector, because you're very concerned about the private sector, I would agree with you. The the private sector are very sharp in their analysis. They are they also have very sophisticated systems. The sad thing about the resilience platform right now, or even the preparedness and emergency platform, is that that space is now being occupied by private sector. Um, they created their own foundations and then implemented their own resilience and disaster preparedness measures. Uh, whereas before they channeled it to foundations and gave it to to civil society or organizations so my take on that is rather than us making the system more complicated is that we have we have to develop clarity on what significant change do we really want uh to 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 have on the ground and then uh be clear on the linkages you know on the entire value chain of our work you know so whether you're doing advocacy at one end of, of the the continuum how does our advocacy really make meaningful changes in the lives of the people that we wish to serve i think that link would it's, it's necessary and that link is also part of that whole continuum between policy of advocacy movement building and programmatic work uh, at the community level so i'll end there thank you yep. thank you thank you jessica i think from the q a there are eight questions but the key points that are being raised by our participants are one is on metrics so maybe someone can if you want to make comment maybe you can make comment about how do we make sure that we adopt some metrics and make our governments accountable to their commitments to this global framework and their commitments to the national program? So that's one on metrics and uh, measuring uh, success in terms of our commitments. And then there's another point raised on, uh, which I think is uh, quite relevant, is on uh, sharing of uh, knowledge and experience. So what are the current uh, venues where each country can, can continue beyond this webinar, can continue to link and share experiences and even join advocacy at the region level to make a stronger voice for influence. And then uh, finally, there is a question about localization again, like how do we ensure that our local, uh, that our national governments will you know, adopt a coherent approach to program. Just as what is happening at the global level, there is some coherence, but it remains to be seen at the national and local level. So how do you think you know, we should do as local NGOs to you know, hasten and to fast track that kind of coherence building at the national level? Private sector, metrics, and coherence at the national policies. So, any comments from our panelists? Maybe, yeah. Loy, maybe Loy can make a comment because you. I'll, are... I'll make a quick comment. Yeah. Yes, Loy. I mean, we have to work in partnership with government. We have to work with local government. So, look, look. Sorry, start my video. Can you? Hear? Yeah, uh, local government has to deliver, and local government needs help. In fact, they are under. So we need to become partners with local government. And so this is one comment. I think private sector getting involved is good. They have historically stayed away from this subject. And it doesn't mean that they have to channelize everything through, through NGOs. But for NGOs and private sector to have a dialogue as to how they will partner, that is something which needs to be done. It's not exclude them, it's partner with them. And maybe this is a tripartite discussion with government. Maybe, and, and there are two levels or three levels of government, uh, national and local. So uh, I, I know some of you disagree with it. I know Jessica's view in particular, but uh, perhaps we need to be innovative in our approach. So I'm actually going for another meeting here, uh, which is actually adopting this approach. So if there's any
quick question or comment from anybody, I can listen to it and then need to leave. Uh, Lloyd, just to react on what you said, I'm not yeah. actually in particular against, you know, um, working with the private sector. It's necessary to engage them. Mm. It's just that when we are talking about issue of financing mm. um, and you're calling for community-based disaster risk reduction, we need to have clarity on that because uh, there are, there's private sector actually that only focus on uh, business continuity. Uh, you know, in the private sector when it mm -hmm. comes to disaster preparedness or disaster risk reduction. Mm -hmm. What we need, when we engage them, we need to look at co-beneficial modes of, of, uh, of implementation of disaster risk reduction. So we have to negotiate that while they're looking at perspectives of business continuity on preparedness mm -hmm. and risk reduction for their own businesses, these projects should have co-benefits for communities. I, and I think that's mm -hmm. the, the point I wish to raise. So I have no argument uh, with engaging the private sector. In fact, we already do, uh, you know, um, where we are right now. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And yeah, thank my you. quick quick response yeah. is <laughs> okay. No, right. no, I completely agree with what you said. The important thing is to connect them with community movements. And sometimes this is difficult for them. So that's the role which NGOs can play. And you need to engage in that dialogue. So that that's my straight thought for now. And I really need to leave. So uh, thank you very much, Loy, for for for, for oh, my pleasure, my pleasure, yeah, uh, for joining us, and we'll send you and yes, all the yes. participants the pro yes. the proceedings. Yeah. So, any okay. uh, from Nepal, Ram, any comments on private sector on metrics? Like, how do you how do you, how do we how do we take our governments accountable you know, to the commitments they are making? Uh, even in Myanmar, Zin can make yes. a comment. So, yeah. who wants to go for uh, Ram? Yeah. Zin. Can I? Yeah. Zin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can I? Yes. Go. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Zin. No, just to um, just to add uh, Jessica point you know, for, for the the business continuity uh, for the business uh, businesses. So it is not only for their their business uh, continuation and the profit, because on, on the other hand, you know, uh, the normal if you know does that that's right? If, if if the business business mean you know not not the very very big company. It's what I mean is like uh, you know there's small and medium enterprises, for example tea shop, mm. you know mohinga shop and noodle shop something like this. If there's a strike right, and then you know, the people from the community, you know they usually buy the the, the the tea or the noodle every morning at the corner of their street. Then you know after after the strike, right, if they cannot buy the the tea or the, the noodle and they feel like they, they are not at the normal situation yet, so. On the other hand, you know, supporting SME, uh, you know, to, 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 to prepare for the disaster, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, supporting people to feel like, you know, if disaster strike or not strike, they can buy tea and noodle every day, every morning, you know, at, at the corner of the street. This is also, you know, one of the points for, uh, I mean, to think of the business resilient as well. Uh, this is, you know, uh, on the, yeah, that, that's, that's what I would like to Yep. So thank you, Zin, Zin Min. Uh, Ram, maybe you can make a comment about metrics. Like, uh, is the Nepal government have some very clear uh, measuring tool in terms of how do they make sure that the commitments that they are making in these DRR policies in Nepal are actually being realized uh, by government and through these partners? Yeah. Programs. It's a, it's a, in, the, in the private sector now, the government of Nepal is uh, inviting to uh, participate in the events and the development, uh, policy development process in this, uh, in this period. Because it was very gaps uh, to um, work with the private sector. Private sector is a uh, very uh, interesting uh, size uh, for the humanitarian support after the emergency in the, in the, in the time of the emergency. But uh, the government is now, government and Dependent Nepal and the CSO is asking for the DRR actions, uh, risk reduction in the preparedness uh, with the private sector too. That's for um, the national platform of DRR also form a uh, group of the private sector. That's all, uh, the um, private sector will engage here uh, in the group and they will work. Uh, they, uh, it is uh, very important to 
uh, develop their uh, understanding. Uh, disaster risk reduction and preparedness is the very important part before disaster. Then the, the uh, disaster response framework also indicate uh, the responsibility of the res role and responsibility of the private sector, which is okay. uh, going to influence uh, very soon. Uh, yes, okay. it's it's a situation, and um, we need to develop a uh, matrix uh, for the uh, yeah. how can they participate in the disaster risk reduction and uh, humanitarian support in the future. Yeah. Uh, Wilson, can I just yes. add to that? Yes. And, and augment yes, the does. response of Loy earlier. See, mm. uh, you have all of this. Imagine if you're you're a member of the government and you have all of these international frameworks uh, hovering around you. The challenge is how to make sense of it and find actually its links to national development priorities. You know, and and our entry points there, and and if you he heard, for example, the the uh, the presentation from 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 uh, mm. Nepal is is to really localize all of these. You know, so we need to be able to once the government accepts the global frameworks, we need to push for the localization of these frameworks and mm. make sure they are embedded in all developments, uh, development plans, development priorities, and development projects. You know, and um, uh, um, of course, uh, along the way, that is where you actually lay out your the metrics, you know. But my suggestion mm -hmm. would be is that we, you know, uh, civil society organizations support or enhance or engage in in the metrics development process, so that we don't we are not just at the complaining end. You know, when mm. once the projects are done, we're part, we actively engage with them in developing the matrix. And in the process, we call on, on that accountability. But there's a mm. big challenge across Asia right now. You know, not of all of us are in governments that have political spaces for participation. Mm -hmm. There is uh, currently uh, uh, a restriction, you know, on civil society participation in different parts of Asia, and we need to hurdle that. So what I'm saying is that we need brave women and men who have clarity in their thinking on what needs to be done in terms of risk reduction, uh, climate change adaptation, and in the achievement of sustainable development goals, and go fight for it with one clear vision because mm -hmm. that is what needs to be done at this point in time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Uh, I think we need to wrap up our Q&A uh, discussion. The, I, I know there will be a number of questions that we still have to respond, but we will respond to them offline. But just to close this uh, Q&A, can I ask like Jessica and Ram and, and Zin Min, like if, if you are to suggest like one concrete action that local NGOs and their networks should prioritize uh, and this action is very important to you know to realize the and respond to the urgency of our challenge of of, of increasing disaster risk and uncertainties of climate change what is it that 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 ultimate action that local NGOs should uh, put a priority you know whatever context you are working in in the region or in the countries. So what is it that one action that local NGOs and networks should do for our participants to, to hear? Who wants to go first? Uh, uh, Ram, maybe you, should, you can go respond. What is it one action in Nepal that DPNet should prioritize to make sure that, you know, we will address yeah, this it's, a, it's a capacity building because we because in the local level we found the skill of the DRR and humanitarian support and uh, preparedness is very gaps. Mm -hmm. There is a very gap. That's so we need to local organization need to uh, develop the capacity. Capacity building is the major component and uh, ensure some fundings for the mainstreaming in the uh, mainstreaming in the sectoral development uh, plan. Uh, it's a, it's a key component, I think. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. So it's capacity building for our local NGOs, and uh, and, and and some funding for 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 them also to to realize uh, their own initiatives and programs. Uh, Zin, for Myanmar. Uh, Zin is still uh, you still here. Okay, so while waiting for Zin, maybe Jessica can 
one final action proposal. Okay. Uh, just want to point out that the IPCC 1.5 report says we all we barely have 12 years, you know, to to um, to really do significant action before we get to the point of no return in terms mm -hmm. of the climate related hazards that we have. So we have 12 years. Uh, and in that 12 years, the demand really is to build resilience so that we survive these challenges and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, be able to significantly reduce our, our, our risk. Having said that, there's a need for innovation. So my suggestion is for civil society organizations to sit down together, think through a lot of things and come up with innovative pipeline of projects and programs that the government can actually invest in. Um, and, and these are projects with quick return of investments on resilience of communities and ecosystems. And it needs a lot of, of uh, thinking, you know, and passionate work here. Mm -hmm. and, and once we have that pipeline, you know, go hard, work hard to advocate for, to secure um, policy and resources for them. So I think I'll end there. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Zin? Zin Min? Yeah. yeah. For um, Myanmar? For Myanmar, what I would like to um, recommend to the NGO or the CSO network um, regarding the coordination mechanism. I mean, uh, all the, this agency, the, the, the local NGOs and CSOs should take the leading role in the coordination among, you know, among the government and also the other stakeholders. So this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the important role um, the NGO should play. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all our guests and uh, speakers and uh, you know you have shared valuable insights into this into this topic and uh, I think we have discussed a lot of practical things that uh, we can all take back to our own respective organizations and and think about so one is on innovations one is on capacity development another is on continuing engagement with local governments uh, continue to evolve our relationships, you know, the, the, the relationship and the approach of local NGOs towards the private sector as we bring them into the fold of disaster risk reduction, preparedness and resilience building. And, uh, and we have a lot and, and we have a number of uh, insights that we will you know, distill in our documentation and report which we will, we will make available in our uh, NGO DPP website. So we will continue our conversations. So I would, I would uh, suggest to our uh, participants to come visit our disaster preparedness website. The link is uh, flashed on the screen. So if you Google dppasia.net, then you will find our community of practice website. So it is a website where we distill all the content from the this program on NGO disaster preparedness with Give to Asia and IIRR uh, to bring about all this uh, sharing plat to, this is a sharing platform for all the local NGOs. Uh, this webinar is recorded, so it will be made available uh, later on in this website also. Uh, the link is there uh, in the screen. You can view the recording of this webinar if you are if you want to review what are the key lessons and points that being discussed uh, we have discussed in the past uh, uh, minutes and uh, on that note thank you very much for our participants uh, for our guests for jessica for ram and zin and loy who made time and uh, and, and 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 join join us in 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 this webinar uh, we invite you to continue to engage with us through the website, the different avenues. Uh, thank you to the support team from IRR uh, for arranging the Zoom and all. So thank you very much and a good day to all.